This episode of Crawl Space is sponsored by the new podcast, Euphemet. And a little bit later, we're going to hear from the podcast host, Jim Perry. This episode is an interview with a very interesting woman. You may recognize her voice if you are familiar with true crime books. She is the voice of the audiobook for I'll Be Gone in the Dark, and it's Gabra Zachman. So I hope you enjoy the interview. Thank you for listening. Welcome to Crawl Space, Gabra Zachman. How are you today? Hey, I'm great. I'm here in a, in a New York heat wave, just just really like like bathing in the sauna of New York right now. So you're recording this from your sound booth in your place. So that's cool. So what do you have a sound booth for? I record audiobooks um, for for most of my living, and sometimes I'm in New York studios. Um, and, and oftentimes I'm here where you see, where you see me right now, I'm actually, I play around with different seats for my back. So right now I'm sitting on an exercise ball, <laughs> which is actually a pretty cool way to, to sit for a while. You know, it's much better than a typical seat. I started when I was sitting in a chair, I started to get a lot of back pain, but yeah, I'm in this booth in my home, a beautifully built booth that was built by, um, some friends of mine who have studios further out in Queens. Um, uh, my friends, Pete and Judy of Row and Audio. Um, they built this studio for me and I, I, um, frequently am found in here. I actually, the outside of it is stenciled with damask, which they did beautifully. And I often call it the damask coffin. I find myself kind of buried (laughs) within it. So for so long, for so many hours during the day, I'm like, like tucked inside this, this little booth in New York recording stories. So that's a lot of my living though, is what I do. That's a good, uh, that's a good segue there before we get into the point of, this interview, you are primarily an audiobook narrator. How did you get into that? And your your body of work is extremely diverse. Can you talk about that uh, for us for a little bit? Thank you so much for asking um, and for for noticing that I I have had such a a diverse career over different disciplines as well as different genres of recording. Um, I initially started. I I went to school. Um, I got a um, graduate degree in classical acting from the Shakespeare Theater in DC. And so my work in in theater then became very focused on on classics. And I did a lot of classics, a lot of new plays as well, actually. And for a very long time, I was recording, sort of recording by day and performing at night or vice versa. Um, I initially got into audiobook narration as a day job and and as an alternative to the restaurant work and the catering that I was doing. Although what started out for me as a day job really became such a great craft for me. And it's now what I do primarily and I love it. Um, But it didn't start out that way. It started out, I was doing work for the National Library Service for the Blind. I was doing nonprofit work, reading in every discipline you can imagine. and that's kind of where it began. And then from there, I started to do commercial work. And initially, I started to record a lot of romance, um, which I loved doing. I loved the world of romance. Um, but from there, branched out to all sorts of different genres. And what I would say that I primarily record now, and now I've made a shift in my life over the last couple of years. So I was doing 50-50 recording and stage work. Um, and I'm also a writer as well. So I've published a book series as well. Um, but I would say that now most of my time is is spent recording audio and that the genres that I primarily work in are memoir or nonfiction and sci-fi and fantasy. And I always like to say that I feel like science fiction and Shakespeare are so connected because they're both really focused on the creation of new worlds and new words. And um, I've always really loved and valued my training because I think my training in the classics, in a way, gave me great skills to be able to narrate all of the, the really cool sci-fi and fantasy I do now, in addition to the memoir, the nonfiction, and the occasional romance. Well, Tim discovered your collection of romance novels, and he would uh, personally appreciate if you'd come back into that realm a little bit more. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Do you mean the the stuff the stuff that I've narrated the romance yes. that I've narrated? Yes. Um. So I I started out. You know, I I have to be honest and say I'm not quite sure what what happened because I loved narrating romance. Um. And I've I've done a ton of it, and um, and I think you know I I I would jokingly say that maybe I aged out of narrating romance, but I don't actually think that's the truth. I think that. A lot of my producers and publishers uh, caught on to the fact that um, that I could do a lot of the books that involve that involve research and that involve sort of a different kind of complexity that's often in nonfiction or sci-fi and fantasy. And so I think they've pushed me in that way. But I just loved romance. I mean, I you know, it's so interesting what I always say about romance, because I think, you know, romance is one of the highest selling or the the highest selling genre of books and audiobooks. What I always say about romance is, you know, people people sort of are like, oh, you know, romance, blah, blah, blah. And, and I always think, in in my opinion, when I would narrate it, I would think about who was listening. And I would think of like maybe women raising children, or maybe someone like driving on her way to work, or maybe a guy who's like, Ugh, taking me away from this like miserable whatever that I'm doing but regardless it's an escape right and so I would think about who those people were who needed this escape and I guess for me there was there was never anything superficial or trivial about telling a beautiful romantic sexy story to someone who badly needs that in their life I always thought it was the coolest thing ever and uh I I did notice all the uh the the books that you had read and I think it was like 50 you have 15 pages of credits on um audible so oh that- yeah that's so that's so nice yeah I've I've recorded at this point over 300 audiobooks and I I can't be positive as to exactly how many because a number like a, at least I think I did at least 60 or 70 for the um nonprofit that was for the National Library Service for the Blind which I also loved doing so I would add that on. And then, you know, anyone who reads romance at all also has a pseudonym. So there's books under my pseudonym, too. But ah. I won't. Re- it's very, very, very James Bondy. I won't reveal to you what my pseudonym is. Is your, is <laughs> your pseudonym actually James Bond? <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. Jane. My pseudonym is actually James Bond. <laughs> Jane, Jane, Jane Bond. Bond yeah. It's a great idea. <laughs> Fabulous idea. Now, what was the most popular book you had the, uh, the chance to do the audiobook for? I suppose in terms of ratings, like if I were to look, at, you know, I've had so many popular series that have been that have been really loved, loved and beloved. But but honestly, the the one that has is the most popular is I'll Be Gone in the Dark, it's one of the more recent ones. And it's um, I know something that, that you wanted to talk to me about today, but that one's actually been. I think my top rated audiobook. You got on our radar, first of all, with the narration of I'll Be Gone in the Dark. I was nervous before starting this interview that I would have some sort of PTSD hearing your voice. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing your voice, uh, it it seriously is. A, it's a terrifying book to read. It's even more terrifying when you're in your apartment cooking dinner and listening to it. Um, it's yes. it's it's an exceptional job narrating that book, and that is why we decided to uh, reach out to you and speak to you. But coincidentally, the book just be had some accolades uh, bestowed upon it. Can you talk to us about that? It was. It's it's really been for me. I feel like this whole experience has been. I feel like someone gave me a front row t- like ticket to the to the to the best show on earth like a front row seat to the best show on earth. This whole thing has just been extraordinary to be to be a part of. And yes, there was um I know there was there was a uh, an article that came out, Audible did at one point their like best books of 2018 so far. And it was mentioned as part of that. It was also the number one, the New York Times cited it as the number one nonfiction audiobook. So it's gotten a number of those. It's been on the Audible top 10 since the book came out. I don't know. I've been really, um, to say grateful would be the an understatement. I, I feel so extremely lucky that I was chosen to for this job, you know? Did you record it right in that booth that you're sitting in now? No, you know, I can't imagine anything more terrifying. I was already I didn't sleep the entire time. I was so scared. I'm glad you mentioned how scary the book was because I was so frightened. And here I am, right? I live in this apartment that I'm deeply in love with in New York City. But I'm a single woman living alone in an apartment reading this story. 
Um, and it scared me so bad. I was like up at night being like window guards, you know, <laughs> just every noise was like, oh, it scared me so badly. So I, I, I can only imagine that if I had been like embalmed in this studio, which I affectionately call the damask coffin, if I had been sort of embalmed in my own studio reading this story, I just don't know that I would have made it out alive. So happily, I was actually recording this with John Marshall Media, which is a wonderful studio in, in New York City with one of the Harper producers, Katie Ostroka was there to produce and direct and help me along with it. And it was wonderful to actually be able to talk with with Katie and with the engineer, Tony, and to for all of us to be able to actually talk about the book as I was reading it, because I found it both terrifying at times, but also really, really emotional at others. I felt really, I don't know, just just very overwhelmed with the with with my feelings towards anyone, the victims who had gone through these crimes. And and this was recorded. The book was written and the book was recorded before he was then caught. So there was there's been several waves of emotion, I feel like, and several experiences that have gone along with now being acquainted with this story. We are with Jim of Euphemet. How's it going, Jim? It's going so well, guys. I'm uh, a little tired. I haven't been sleeping a lot. I've been researching interesting supernatural personal experiences, uh, reading a lot of crazy books that maybe give me some clues in terms of what these people are experiencing. And I'm super excited to be on the show talking with you guys. (laughs) Well, we are excited to have you on. Your show is extraordinarily fascinating. Can you let the listeners know what Euphemet is? Yeah, Euphemet is a show about the unknown and our relationship to it. And and that piece, the, our relationship to it, is, is key for Euphemet because th- these are stories from real people. Uh, they're real strange stories and and how these these paranormal or supernatural or or esoteric experiences have really like reshaped their life and what they've done to them as people we look beyond the veil and then we take another two steps back and like see what else happened here so what is so special about euphemet what's special about euphemet is that we have myself included, a team of producers with boots on the ground that are rustling up these stories of finding these personalities, of finding these incidents, right, that are sort of beyond our popular consensus of what consciousness of what reality really is. And so, you know, we're looking for ways to get in there and relate these stories to people's real lives. And we're doing that face to face with these folks. And so we're climbing mountains, like literally, I just climbed a mountain two weeks ago um, in the middle of the desert. Uh, And so we're really out there just trying to get these stories. So what can we expect from you, Fumet? We're going to find the UFO witness, the contactee, the folks experiencing, you know, figures at their bedside we're going to find all of these sort of stories and and capture them in new and brilliant ways that really have heart and personality but we're also going to look for those stories that you don't know of you know that neighbor you have that has had this experience that he hasn't ever shared with anyone because maybe he hasn't felt comfortable enough we're going to start bringing those stories to light So you're given the book and you read it on your own privately to get familiar with it. And then you go into a studio and you work with directors and producers and audio engineers. Did you guys have any concept of how big this was going to be? I didn't at all. It was so great. I was at at some point in the middle of, of recording it. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We stopped and kind of talked about all of the players involved, um, including Pat Oswalt, the amount of people who were involved in the making of this. And I was so glad that when I read the book, that just wasn't in my mind. I sort of, I, don't, I knew the story of Michelle and, and her life and, uh, you know, tangentially, but I was so glad that I wasn't more acquainted with it before recording this, because I don't think I would have done a very good job if I thought it would have been such a big deal. Does that make sense? There were too many negatives in that statement. But if I had had any idea that this was going to be such a big deal, I would not have done a very good job. I would have been too nervous. I think my reading would have been really tight. 
you probably would have uh, tried to have these expectations of yourself just based on the expectations of the book. So that definitely, exactly. yeah, that probably, exactly. It was such a blessing that I had no idea that this was going to be this big. Nobody had any idea that it was really going to be this big. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Except us true crime fans. We knew. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. I listened, by the way, I listened to, um, uh, your podcast, um, on the Golden State Killer that you did also before he was caught. Great. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. We had yeah, Mike Morford on. I thought it was wonderful. And actually, you know, listening to it now, you, you got a lot of things right. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Mike <laughs> Morford, he was doing a podcast on the case um, yes. when when it happened called called Criminology. And then we also yes. spoke to uh, Billy Jensen and Paul Haynes at CrimeCon uh, after the Golden State Killer was caught. And so that, uh. that was pretty interesting, too. Oh, that's amazing. I've connected with both of them on social media and they just seem I, I'm, I so admire them. I mean, obviously, I admired the, the work they did and the writing and how they put everything together. But um, I so admire what they do. Amazing. Yeah, they're awesome. Yeah. So you never had a chance to meet them or you haven't yet? No, I haven't. But I really look forward to it at some point. I'm sure that's coming at some point in some very random way. You know, I feel like we'll be in a coffee shops in some weird location in the country and be like, wait a minute, you're who? Oh, hey. <laughs> yeah, like one of them will hear you order the coffee and they'll say, that voice <laughs> sounds so familiar. Now, I think a lot of our listeners, uh, they consume audiobooks, but they probably have no idea how the process actually works. So you mentioned you there was a director there from Harper. So wh what does the director do when you're reading this book? That's a really wonderful question because depending on who you're working for and what you're doing, you may or may not have an engineer, right? If I'm working at home, I'm the engineer. And you may or may not have a producer around, and you may or may not have a director around. Sometimes the engineer is also the producer and the director. These are jobs, people who work on, on sort of the, the, the other side of the mic wear many hats often, and it works differently according to the producer, according to the book, according to the studio. So in this case, there was an engineer who was there solely to to make sure that I sounded okay and that everything was going all right. And then Katie was then a producer and acting as director. And basically what she would do is she's listening to me read and she would say, um, you know, there was, there was some interesting shifts in when in Michelle's writing in when it was really her story and when she was really personally involved versus when she was really telling other people's stories. There was a slight shift in tone and, and a little bit in like narrative tone. So my director producer would keep me on task as, as in terms of that's, that hits the right tone for that, or maybe we need to shift a little bit for that. Um, and anytime, you know, if I read something that wasn't quite clear and maybe she would say, I don't, I'm not quite getting the sense of that. Can you try that a different way? You know, again, directors are, some of them are very hands off. Some of them are extremely hands on. But their their job is to make sure that the story is being told, that the, the writer's words are coming to life in the appropriate way. How often would she chime in with with a note? You know, I would say not not a tremendous amount. It was really when things when when something was a little off or when something was confusing or if I was tipping my hand a little bit too much in one way or another, making something over dramatic when it didn't need to be making something overly emotional when it didn't need to be. Then she would chime in. I would say she was pretty, pretty spare in her commentary. We were all really, really taken with the story. So I think we all got quite a bit drawn in and involved. And and for the most part, I think we just remained there unless something kicked us out of it, in which point one of us would say, wait a minute, can we take that back? Or I'm not hearing that right. Or I think we, we misread that or that's not pronounced that way or whatever. For some reason, when listening to the book, whenever there was a moment where you said a quote from somebody and then applied it to the person with a name, and it wasn't their real name, and you said not their real name or not her real name or not his real name, there was something right. so haunting about hearing what you said before that, and then you say not their real name. I don't know what it was by the tone yeah. that, that you had there, but that was, that was it felt like these hooks that kept going in when you'd explain a situation, uh, give an account from someone, and then follow mm -hmm. it up with not their real name. There's just It just added this like punctuation that 
wasn't uh, wasn't there before, and all of a sudden it was there, and you realize, wow, this has some like significance to it because it's not their real name. I'm so glad that you brought that up because that was actually one of the things I think we talked about the most because we couldn't quite figure out in the book. I believe those are footnoted, and we couldn't quite figure out how to make those a compelling part of the narrative. So I'm so glad <laughs> that you just brought that up because we were like, we don't want to take people out here, but we have to mention it. But it's really quite important, and how do we make it? And so the the language of that, that would have been something where, where Katie, my director, producer, would have stepped in to say, I think this sounds better here. This is a better way of putting it here. Because we used a couple of different catchphrases to indicate it wasn't someone's real name. Yeah, I, it definitely didn't take the listener out. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was quite the opposite. You you hear that and you go, oh, God, you, you know, here it comes. There's there's something, uh, that's something significant here. Thank you. So when there was a tonal switch for you, with uh with, with some of the the intricacies of Michelle's writing how would you perform that like what what is different for you mm, that's a really good question um i think for me when it was when it was michelle's personal story for me it became more of uh more like memoir and when I say memoir, if it's someone's personal story I'm reading, I don't know how to put this, but I, I tend to read a little bit more from the inside of it, from the first person perspective, from living through the way that I would work on roles as an actor when I was getting inside a character's skin. That for me is what memoir is like, is like, I feel like I'm fusing myself with the author as opposed to the parts that were more like nonfiction, where she's really just describing his crimes. I feel like what I wanted and what I thought maybe people hearing it would want is a little more distance. So I don't think this is a huge shift, but it, it um, was a subtle shift, but it was definitely an intended shift. Well, it has to be big for you or, or something noticeable for you, for the people right. to even uh, pick up on it at all um, right. or for you to really feel good about that job. So, yeah, that's that's excellent. When listening, it is apparent that when you're speaking from Michelle's life, some something more like a memoir, when she's talking about going out with her husband and leaving early or taking a phone call uh, from, you know, Paul Holst or something, there is definitely a, a tonal shift there between that and simply uh, accounting for the Golden State Killer's actions on a particular night. So, yeah. That, right. Absolutely. I also feel I feel like... Um, with memoir, which I've done more and more and more of, and it's one of my very favorite things to narrate, I feel there's a real sensitivity needed. People are always telling a personal story, and it's right from them. You know, I, I just feel there's an there's an element of, like, compassion and sensitivity. You really want to be telling the story the way you imagine they would want it to be told. And especially in the case of Michelle, I was very conscious of the fact that she was no longer around to tell me how she wanted her story to be told. So I wanted to extend extra sensitivity towards trying to tell this story as close to in what I imagined her voice to be as I possibly could. Was that part of those expectations that you spoke of earlier, if you had those expectations uh, going into it? Thank God I didn't have more expectation going into it because already, right, already what I knew of her was very little, but I knew that I knew a little bit about her story. I knew who she was and I knew that she was no longer with us. You know, that already is is a tremendous amount of, I wouldn't even say pressure. It's just I want so badly then to tell the story the way the way the person would want me to. But I feel that way about all of them. I feel that way about someone I might an author I might talk to on the phone who says this is a very personal story about my family. I want so badly to to tell it in a way that would make them happy, you know, where I'm really, really giving their words the life they would have wanted. And so especially it just became a little bit more knowing that she had passed. And then had I then known kind of the just the surrounding of which I really didn't know very much about um, the surrounding parts of her life um, and and Patton's life and and how much weight this would then take on in the coming weeks, like her her presence in the true crime community. And then once he was caught, I, I just had no sense of that. And I'm so grateful I didn't. And I feel like if I was reading a memoir, I would I would slow down a little bit and maybe get a little closer mm. to the mic and kind of mm. uh, lower my voice even a little bit. 
Um, that's lovely. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Thanks. I agree. That's that's wonderful. Yes, now, I think that's right on. You're talking about intimacy, right? Yes, there's, exactly. There's a yes, level of intimacy. Tim, Tim's afraid to say that word. <laughs> I'm terrified of that word. Um, <laughs> how, how did you get this job? You mentioned that you speak to authors occasionally. Um, did did Patton call you, or did your agent call you, or how did this come about? No, you know. I, First of all, I'm very proud of this. So I'm going to say this because I have agents and have had agents for almost everything I've ever done. But I've never had an agent for audiobook work. I've, this whole business I've built by myself with no agent. And, That's um, impressive. And I'm very proud of that. Wow. Um, not to say that they wouldn't help in some ways. Uh, they would. Um, but but there was no agent involved here. So this was um, this was I was directly reached. Uh, I believe Harper reached out to me. I think they asked me to do an audition for it, um, which I did for my home studio and didn't think anything. At that point, I had no idea what it was. I just it was, you know, maybe the first chapter or so. And I recorded an audition for them. And then they said, great, we'd love to cast you in this. It was no different from any other book I would have gotten from them. I had no idea it was a big deal. Nothing nothing about it rang as any different from any other book I would have done. How did you approach speaking the Golden State Killer's words in the in the Ooh, book. Such a good question. Yeah, that's such a good question because I was told <laughs> I was told I think I I don't know that I had heard him speak those words before. I think I subsequently listened after I recorded them. But I there was a whole we were having a whole conversation about it because I was like, do I listen to him and try to imitate him? And 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 they didn't want that at all. And I was like, well, that's good because I haven't heard it yet. I subsequently listened to it and then didn't sleep for, you know, weeks. But I I think I just I think we did it a few. I know we did it a few times. And I think there's only that one line or, or so in the book, because I remember us doing it a few times and me being like, is this suitably creepy, but not caricature, which was what we were going for. I said, I just want this to be suitably creepy and not in any way a caricature because actually his own voice I believe is kind of like a caricature but I didn't want to imitate anything and I didn't want it to seem caricature or funny or outside the realm of when you read memoir or nonfiction for the most part it's a much more subtle read than if you're doing something like fantasy right where maybe the voices are extraordinary or different accents or you know I always think of Darth Vader of course you know what I mean you want it to be extreme maybe in some way but not when you're reading memoir or nonfiction. So I wanted it to be subtle, but I wanted people to get it. So oh. we worked on that. I think I think we did a few reads of that. Well, mission accomplished on that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Good. What was it like for you when you found out he got arrested? I was down in Florida visiting one of my dear friends, having this like wonderful, long awaited vacation. And I was on my way home that day. And when I tell you, I got like it like like I had been arrested. I got the amount of messages I got from people saying, have you heard the news? Have you I was actually woken up by a friend's text being like, have you seen? Have you heard the news? Have you seen what's going on? Um, and sort of as the day unfolded, I remember I got to the airport and had a gigantic Bloody Mary, which I think is appropriate, right? <laughs> um, both in honor of the news and also because I was very overwhelmed by how I was suddenly involved with the news, you know? But I at first was very overwhelmed just to, to see that that had happened and then to know that it was Michelle's words that were so instrumental in that. I just, I was so thrilled for her. You know, I think it was... It was everything that this woman was working towards came to pass. And I was so amazed and awed and thrilled and proud of this woman's work. And so tangentially to have just been a part of the voicing of it, um, I just I really felt such gratitude to have been involved in this in some way. But I I also felt I don't know if you felt this way. Did you feel this sense of, um, I don't know, like a sense of kind of a, a, a real compassion towards and like a weight being lifted off of all of the victims. I, I, that's like, like such a feeling that I've never had before of just it having been so many years of people, of, of, of this man still being out there. And then when they caught him, there was this like, <gasps> like a released breath. I don't know what their experiences must have been like. I can't imagine. But uh I just felt a sense of like 
relief kind of and like gratitude that he had been caught and I don't know. There's um, so many victims because you're not just talking about the people who were killed or the people who were raped. You're talking about their families too. Oh yeah. No, I mean their families. I mean I, also I think the people who were equally victimized by a lot of the the thing that haunted me the most were a lot of times while the rapes were going on what was happening with the husbands, how they were then being tortured and they were in another room being forced to overhear the crime going on that that was the thing that actually gave me nightmares was that was how that would wreck uh just wreak havoc upon a family and generations to come kids being in the houses so it was that it was that massive community that's a tremendous amount of crimes a tremendous amount of people and then a tremendous amount of family members who were all involved in this who in some way i feel like were able to just release something when he the moment he was caught. And they also have a rare opportunity to see justice being served because it right. has been so long since the Golden State Killer committed a crime. And I'm sure a large majority of the victims were preparing themselves to, you know, themselves die without having any resolution because they probably assumed that he had died. But you know what? If he's alive, he's probably in his mid to late 70s, and they're probably losing hope. So it was this collective, you know, we said sigh of relief, but it's also this collective, like, inflation of hope as well, because look at look at what happens when people don't give up. Like, I thought I thought that was one of the most impressive things with the whole thing. Absolutely. No, it's it's that it was truly something it was it's been truly something to witness, to be part of, to get to see. It was one of the the big things about her book is that she kept saying, I know, I know you're still out there. I know you're still out there, even though, you know, uh, by common, common knowledge would dictate that, that he had passed that serial, serial rapists, serial murderers never stop. Mm -hmm. And so if his crime stopped, it must've been that he, that he died and she knew he wasn't dead. She knew he was still alive. She knew it. It was just eerie what she predicted. And she predicted that that he would be found through DNA evidence as well. So she was like, it was this was like a voice from beyond the grave. There's also that the end of the book, the the letter to an old man at the very end with her, you know, basically saying, come, it's her her words saying, come into come into the light. Step out, come into the light. I don't want to misquote her, but um so moving, so moving to then watch that happen and to and to feel like she in some way called it, predicted it, conjured it in a way. Was there any part of reading it that got under your skin and continues to resonate with you? Well, I think that part. I mean, I think that it, that her her voice saying her that like smart, smart mind, that compassionate heart and that smart, smart mind saying come out, come out. You know, we know you're still there. Come out. Gosh, that, that got me. That really, really got to me. And then, you know, the other stuff was some of, some of the details of those crimes did get under my skin, unfortunately. Yeah. You... That's a little hard for them not to. Right. Right. It was like the, the teacups, like the, that kind of thing that those, some of those details sometimes late at night, you know, when I walk into my apartment alone, Every once in a while, one of those details comes to me. <laughs> what about uh, seeing him in a cage in in courtroom? How is that? It's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. I find it fascinating. Um, some one thing I was thinking about from your podcast that I was listening to was um, you were all talking about the idea of well, he could possibly, you know, he would have had a submissive wife potentially, or he he might be married, or he might have children, or. And that's what I couldn't stop thinking about, actually, seeing him in a, in a courtroom or seeing him behind bars. I couldn't stop thinking about this person who has children and a family and what what must they think? That's what I couldn't stop thinking about, you know? What must they be thinking? I think that's uh, a lot of people share that thought as well, and it's not a comfortable thought to have. Because... No, it's not, especially because I imagine, you know, as as is the truth with many people who commit crimes, serial and otherwise, um, they're often described even even people, you know, we see all these mass shootings and they sometimes they're described as odd, but sometimes they're just described as like the guy next door, you know? 
Yeah. How many times do you hear that? I never thought that that person would be capable of this. That's right. And I would imagine this on the most colossal level must be what's going on. Like I never imagined my husband was capable of this or I never imagined my father was capable of this or I never imagined my next door neighbor was capable of this. I mean, I, I that's what I think of when I see him. So there's a few more people that he has effectively ruined the lives of without directly raping or killing. Absolutely. When you saw him in court, was he anything like the image that you perhaps conjured in your head while you were reading about him? No, no. Um, I don't know. But I but then he's, you know, in his 70s now. Right. So no, except that, you know what? I would say, let me amend that. No, to a to a. Well, here's the thing, which is that I do feel like a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times the ones who can commit the greatest amount of crimes are the ones who are the most nondescript, (laughs) the ones who would blend in, you know? Sure. And there's something about him that does. I mean, I feel like he's kind of nondescript. He sort of just blends in. And it, that is the one thing that does resonate with, with all with the crime history, with how he was described, with how I would envision him in my, in my head. Now that he's been caught and now that we're talking about stepping into the light you're probably on board to do the sequel to the book, right? <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm just a peon in this industry. They don't tell me things like that. I thought, I thought we'd get some insider info because <laughs> we're, we're waiting for the sequel. And I swear if they don't have you narrate that, then they've, <laughs> they've swung <laughs> and missed so nice. on that one. Yeah. I guess we'll see. But at that point, you know, listen, it depends how much, how much heat winds up under it because, you know, depending, they might, I think they'd go for a real celebrity. (laughs) Like Lance. That's like Lance. Exactly. That's my point. Well, Tim's going to start doing the romance genre, so I might as well tackle the uh, true crime memoirs. Tim, do you want to give me a sample of you reading some romance and I'll I'll listen and critique it? You know, a lot of men, you know, a lot of men record romance. I did not know that. Can I leave oh, yeah. the Can I leave the uh, the room before this happens? <laughs> you might have to. <laughs> no, you absolutely cannot leave the room. Um, it was no, you know, a lot of a lot of there's there's a, a huge call for it. A lot of my friends in the industry, um, a lot of my male friends narrate romance uh, as well. Oftentimes, they're they're heterosexual romances, and it's because women like to listen to men's voices narrate as well as women's, and oftentimes they're gay romances as well. Is this a financially rewarding industry? It's the same. I mean, we get paid the same no matter what we do. You know, I mean, it would be it would be fascinating if like you got paid more money according to genre. But um, no, we get I mean, the, the it's interesting. We get paid different different. Uh, it's different according to, say, the publisher or the producer, or sometimes it's different according to how high profile a book is. Um, but oftentimes not. I mean, this was for this book, for example, um, th- this was my same rate. It was it was. um I did do it in a studio with a with the producer director, but um, you know the rates. It's it's interesting in this business. It's unusual when the when the rates change or when things move or shift. Or... I think that was a rare moment where my sarcasm just didn't play. I actually didn't expect you to answer that. So. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I hope you didn't think I was trying to like dig too deep into your financial uh, <laughs> your, no. your oh, financial no. status. I think people... I feel like people are genuinely interested, aren't they? I feel like I've been asked that question so many times by different people. It's like, what do you get paid? Of which I will not say what I get paid because we're it's not not a smart idea to ever exactly say what your rate is. But I will say that I actually find the payment the payment of books to be really interesting, especially because it's changed as the industry has changed. When when I was a bit younger, um, oftentimes you were paid by project, which means you were given sometimes a lump sum, and now you would never be paid that way. I don't think, uh, maybe, maybe in an exceptional case, but for the most part, we're, we're all paid per finished hour. So if the book is six hours of recorded time, that's what we're paid for. We're paid for six hours. Gabra Zachman, thank you very much for joining us here on Crawl Space today. <laughs> we really appreciate your time and efforts on reading this book. That's good, right? Am I, do I have a career hey, in I this? Would, I, would, I would hire you. I would definitely hire you. I no need to be asked. fanned off here. <laughs> I need to dab my forehead. <laughs> <laughs> so you said that you have a, uh, a series of books um, that you've written as well, right? 
Is this the yes? The, the yes, I wrote squad? I wrote a series that was published. Um, it was published in 2015, 2016, called the Bod Squad series. Great. And what's that about? Yes. And it's a book. It's a it's a, a a sexy spy caper. So basically, what I wrote, I started out kind of writing romance. And then my own inclination, I don't, I'm, I'm something of a goofball. So what I wound up writing, I loved what I wound up writing, though it kind of wound up in a couple of different genres. But I wrote what a friend of mine once described as like a feminist James Bond. Nice. <laughs> which I love. Jane but Bond, this, perhaps? Like, kooky series of like d- detective-ish novels with, you know, yeah, yeah, a lot of like sexy young people and, you know, this caper-esque background of trying to hunt down someone who was trying to blow up the world. And um, I had a tremendous amount of fun writing them. I, I loved writing them. And um, I subsequently got to produce the audiobooks with Audible. Um, and I hired a number of my friends in the industry. So the in the audiobooks of these books, I am I read the narration and then a number of my very dear friends in the industry read all of the characters. Very and then cool. my friend Pete, who is the one who built my booth, he undertook the task of actually cutting that all together. And um, and multicast audiobooks are a little tricky to pull off just because the editing is so complicated. But um, but I loved them. And I find so the books themselves are one thing. And then I think the audio is something else. And I, I just had so much fun being able to have all of my friends in the industry as part of the telling of these stories. All right. Cool. Well, thank you so much. And uh, it's been a, a real pleasure talking to, it's very rare to talk to a person who has uh, effectively creeped me the F out. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh gosh, that makes me happy. I want to put that, I wonder if I can put that on my resume. I will effectively creep you the F out. Thank you.